Located in the small town of Samford in the state of Maine, Emerson's school had seen many good years. Over a hundred years old, Emerson's school was scheduled to be replaced after seeing its run of students. Generations passed through its system and moved on. In 2017, the school property was sold to be replaced with a gas station and convenience store belonging to the Cumberland Farms chain. Children had run happily in the playground, played football, maybe even baseball, not knowing what lay deep beneath the soil, sleeping undisturbed. On May 4, 2017, construction workers were digging for a water line for the gas station when they unearthed a collapsed casket. On further digging, they found human remains and were surprised because the site had been near a school property for years. Who could bury someone so close to the school? Authorities recovered finger bones, a jawbone, teeth, and ribs. As the pelvic bone was missing, it was hard to know whether the remains were male or female. But medical examiners speculated it to be a 10-year-old female child. Officers also found the crumbling pieces of a beautiful antique wooden casket, along with several nickel-plated handles and the coffin's keys. Major Matt Gagné from the Sanford Police Department treated the area as a potential crime scene, but it was later confirmed to be an old gravesite. This was not the first time the people of Sanford came across old bones. In the 1980s, while digging for an elevator shaft of the town hall, they found a leg bone, which turned out to be very old. Experts revealed the casket dates back to the Victorian era, which meant this body was over a hundred years old. Upon discovering something so unique and mysterious, the construction of the gas station was halted. Then came the meticulous task of carefully excavating the grave. The city manager at the time, Stephen Buck, was accompanied by the construction worker's foreman, Peter Smith, as he sifted through the dirt carefully by hand. They were also joined by Paul Auger, who was a teacher as well as a local historian, a member of the Samford Springvale Historical Society's board of directors. Auger was an enthusiast, and as soon as the coffin was discovered, he declared the site to be an historical excavation. The mayor at the time allowed them an extension to properly dig out all the invaluable pieces of evidence. His son, Andrew Auger, helped recover all the pieces carefully without damaging anything, as time had rendered them fragile. Everything was documented as they painstakingly removed shards of glass, pieces of metal and bones covered with dirt and mud. The top of the coffin had a single pane glass window, which was quite common in the Victorian era, according to the Samford Springvale Historical Society. The roots of a nearby oak tree framed the coffin as if out of a fairy tale the root's hairs grown into the casket and remains. They labeled each bone, each artifact such as the two coffin keys and a piece of gingham cloth. A gingham cloth is a sort of plaid check cloth, probably once belonging to a dress. Before reburying the remnants of the coffin, officials felt it was only appropriate to identify the person who was laid to rest there. Some of the proceeds from the sale of Emerson School were used to finance the DNA tests that would be conducted in an attempt to give a name to the deceased. Paul Auger was a high school history teacher, and his students volunteered to help with the identification process. With more hands on deck, the process did not get any easier. The state medical examiner's office had no use for identifying the remains, but Paul Auger championed the cause. 
Mayor Tom Cote prioritized the digging in the local city council's agenda, and the council approved funding. Later on, Mayor Becky Brink would continue to support the cause. The excavation process was lengthy. Paul and his son Andrew looked for more bones with a special sifter that the owner of a nearby Shaw's hardware store customized for this purpose. They were able to find parts of a skull, pieces of vertebrae, ribs, and a mandible with teeth. Teeth typically help identify victims easily, but back then there were no dental records. Still, it is good for DNA evidence. Dirt and root hairs that covered the bones were cleaned with soft, bristled toothbrushes and chopsticks and washed gently with water. After the cleaning, the human remains were laid out on an examination table at the Carl Heald and Black funeral home. By this point, it became public knowledge that the school grounds had previously been Woodlawn Cemetery, as could be seen in photos, maps, and documents from 1889. The land where the new Cumberland Farm store was under construction had been purchased prior to 1889 by Thomas Goodall. Thomas Goodall was the founder of Goodall Mills in the 1860s, who owned the Goodall Mansion across the street. Emerson School, formerly Sanford's High School, was constructed adjacent to the cemetery. The town began relocating graves out of the cemetery around 1900 to make space for the Emerson School, which was built in 1901 and opened to students in 1902. When Willard School was erected in the 1920s, it transitioned to become a high school, while Emerson assumed the role of an elementary school. Sometime in the early 1900s, due to neglect and changing climate, the graves were deteriorating, so they were relocated to Oakdale Cemetery, creating space for a playground at Emerson School. According to the city records, 77 bodies were exhumed on record and reburied at Oakdale. The site was clear enough by 1933 for Emerson School to purchase the grounds. The front page from Samford Tribune and Advocate newspaper of 17th September 1971 ran a headline that read, 300 Emerson School children cheer as Woodlawn Cemetery is converted into playground by town officials. Paul Auger could recall stories of kids bragging about how they used gravestones as third base for baseball. Except, they were not just stories. While the remains were laid out at Carl Heald and Black Funeral Home, they could only deduce they were the bones of a little girl. But it took six long years to identify the Woodlawn Cemetery Doe, as she was dubbed. Initial DNA tests only confirmed the medical examiner's observation. The bones belonged to a woman, but not a little girl, as they had initially assumed. The teeth of the deceased would hopefully provide enough DNA signatures to identify the family this person belonged to. Major Gagné helped upload a genetic profile to the public database known back then as GED Match. Years passed, and finally, Paul Auger contacted the DNA Doe Project in the spring of 2022. The DNA Doe Project helped identify nameless bodies in an attempt to lay the deceased to rest with consent from their loved ones, possibly solving mysteries or reuniting relatives with the bodies of their own kin. Jennifer Randolph of the DNA Doe Project became actively involved in the search for the missing link. This speeded up the entire process. They handed the DNA samples to Parabon Nanolabs. Parabon Nanolabs in Virginia had recently started a forensic genealogy wing, which was relatively new at the time. 
There were many matches, but most of them were inconclusive. Finally, through bioinformatics, the lab's investigative genetic genealogists were able to identify the nameless body by building a family tree from her great-great-niece and nephew. There were three promising leads, a paternal half-great-great-niece, a paternal half-great-great-nephew, and a maternal third cousin three times removed. Linking together their family and putting up a family tree, the DNA Doe Project was able to trace the daughters of Ferdinand and Lois Patton. The real puzzle piece that helped figure it all out was the obituary of one Edith Patton in the Biddeford Daily Journal on November 12, 1891. And that is when it all fell into place. Ferdinand and Lois Patton were residents of Fairfield in Somerset County in the state of Maine, as recorded by an 1870 census. It listed down two of their daughters, three-year-old Edith and two-month-old Elfrida, born in 1867. Edith spent her toddler years in Fairfield. By 1872, her brother Lendell was born as well. In the 1880 census, 13-year-old Edith was employed as a live-in housekeeper in Lewiston, while her father worked at a sawmill. Court records revealed that Lois and Ferdinand Patton divorced after an accusation of adultery in October of 1880. Ferdinand Patton got married again, twice. His second wife was Emma Dinsmore, whom he married in October of 1880. Possibly right after his divorce, she passed away soon after their marriage, leading to a third marriage. He married his third wife in 1884, Agnes Avery, who bore him three sons. The couple had a daughter in 1899 in Chelmsford, Massachusetts. Ferdinand named his daughter Edith May, which was possibly a tribute to the elder sister, Edith. Neither Edith nor her full siblings ever married or had children. Her little brother, Landell Patton, passed away in 1890, and her sister, Elfrida, in 1917. The Biddeford Daily Journal reported Edith's passing. The cause of her ultimate demise was consumption, tuberculosis, which was an epidemic in the 1800s, fatal for one in seven people in the U.S. In 1891, Edith was only 24 years old when she lost her life. To quote the article, she was beloved by a wide circle of friends who sincerely mourn her untimely passing. She was loved enough to be laid to rest in a glass window coffin with nickel-plated handles dressed in her best. Passing at a young age, Edith Patton did not have many papers to record her life. There is no record of when she moved to Springvale. Her parents also passed away within a few years of Edith losing her life. Nevertheless, Paul Auger deduced she could have been working at a shoe shop as women commonly did at the time. Many graves in Woodlawn Cemetery had no gravestone or marker to identify the deceased. Many were in ruins because of the weather and time. Thanks to advancements in technology, 132 years after being left behind, Edith was now discovered, named, and laid to rest properly. She was identified on March 1, 2023 by the DNA Doe Project. Her identity was announced in a press conference held by the DNA Doe Project. Jennifer Randolph of the DNA Doe Project observed that there had been a larger turnout at the Sanford Press Conference than at a 2021 press conference that identified a victim of Chicago serial offender John Wayne Gacy. Randolph mentioned that Edith's identification was a tribute to how caring people of Sanford were. 
She explained the advanced process that led to identifying Edith. This involved working with DNA in a database, analyzing strong matches, and examining various documents like censuses, newspapers, and diaries. While going through a local person's diary, Randolph found a crucial line. Edith Patton passed away today. This discovery boosted the investigation. Paul Auger found the confirming obituary at the MacArthur Library in Biddeford. The notice from November 25, 1891 in the Biddeford Journal mentioned Edith's friends but omitted family details. According to Auger, none of Edith's family members are buried in Sanford. They are all laid to rest in the same cemetery in Auburn, Maine. The city announced Edith was to be buried with the rest of her family at Oak Hill Cemetery in Auburn, with a marker to bear her name. And so, 132 years after she had been laid to rest, Edith Patton was to be reunited with her family, all thanks to advances in DNA technology. The town of Sanford solved the biggest mystery to hit them. Christina Renee King was nicknamed Cricket by her family because she was a small woman. Born in 1972, she was a resident of Kansas City, Kansas. Christina was married to Christopher Wayne Goodall, a roofer by profession. He was a loving husband. In 1988, the couple welcomed their first child, whom they named April. Three years later, she was followed by a baby sister, Ashley. Christopher's job could not sustain the family, so Christine decided that she would look for ways to provide. According to sources, she started soliciting clients for money in an area called Central Street, offering escort services. At some point, Christopher went to prison, and Christina seemed to lose hope. Despite her societal label, the consensus among those who knew her was that she was, in fact, a good person. Yet circumstances had led her to a life on the streets, where she navigated the harsh realities of a world that often overlooked the humanity behind the labels. Christina was jailed briefly, but her recent release from prison marked a somber twist in her story. The day following her release proved to be her last. In 1998, April was in fifth grade, celebrating her 10th Christmas when the family received tragic news. 25th December, Christmas morning. Some boys were scavenging for metal in an attempt to sell off any scrap pieces to the junkyard to make a quick buck. They were looking for salvageable pieces in the driveway of an abandoned nursing home. Then, in the cold silence of the winter morning, they came across a partially naked body, beaten, bruised, and discarded like trash. There was blunt force trauma to the head, her pants half pulled down. The victim's bra, shoes, and various other belongings were scattered nearby. In a gruesome tragedy, the victim's face was smashed in. KCPD informed the family and life changed forever. This was the body of 26-year-old Christina King and a mystery as to who might have taken her life and why ensued. Penny Barnett, Christina's mother, followed up with the KCPD regularly in an attempt to find out whether there was any information. What police failed to convey to Barnett was that they did have a lead, a used condom recovered at the scene of the crime next to Christina's body. In fact, there was quite a bit of neglect and incompetence on their end, but more on that later. Once, while on call, police detective Terry Mast was so harsh with Penny Barnett that she hung up the phone sobbing. When her husband asked the reason, 
She told him Detective Mast had been insensitive and called Christina inappropriate names. There was severe prejudice shown against Christina, where at various points officers told the family that, being a streetwalker as they put it, she was a normal casualty, hinting that she was not exactly a priority. April would later on in life view the autopsy photos of her mother and was shocked to see so many injuries, various abrasions, and bruises on her mother's body. In 2010, Christopher Goodall passed away, leaving the two girls orphaned. But their family was already fractured after Christina's demise. They had been living on their own for five years when Ashley was only 14 and April was 17. Ashley shared that in the past, she used to walk up and down Quindaro searching for the person responsible for her mother's demise. Quindaro was an abandoned settlement, a ghost town in the 90s. It was unsafe. She found herself in risky situations, desperate for closure. Eventually, Ashley got into a truck with someone she believed had a connection to her mother's slaying. The man was supposedly a suspect because Christina King's cousin and two other women stole a large amount of his illegal substances. But that was just a rumor on the street. He was not the person Ashley was looking for, and thankfully he did not harm her. Two decades passed, and there were no further developments. In December 2021, the family gathered on North 27th Street and Sewell Avenue for a prayer vigil and balloon release. The vigil had been arranged by Justice for Wyandotte, an advocacy group dedicated to fighting for transparency in law enforcement. It helped the loved ones of those wronged by the law itself, and so they agreed to help Christina King's investigation. Khadija Hardaway from the Justice of Wyandotte Group organized the entire event. While addressing the people, she emphasized the importance of cases like this, stating that it underscored the necessity for the Kansas Police Department to establish a cold case unit. She requested the new police chief to allocate existing funds for the establishment of a cold case unit. According to Hardaway, this move would enhance transparency in addressing both cold cases and recent investigations. This ignited something in the KCPD that would finally lead to solving Christina's case. The new chief of police, Carl Oakman, would take this request seriously, and right after being sworn in on the 1st of January 2021, he vowed to open up a cold case unit for the force. A year later, true to his word, he managed to establish Kansas City's first cold case, which was operational by January 2022. Employing three full-time detectives, it would help solve decades-old cold cases. The reason why Justice for Wyandotte was established in the first place is important to know. It all started with a 43-year-old mother named Pearl Davis. Born in 1953, Pearl Davis was the cousin to Khadija Hardaway and niece to Imam Hanif Khalil. Mother to two small children, Cordria and Aish Musaver, Pearl was also known as Samima Musaver. A member of the Kansas City Islamic community, she was a hard worker and provided for her children in any way possible. An expert seamstress, she sewed clothes as a service and ran a transportation business providing rides to Chillicothe Correctional. Additionally, she served as an SRS driver, ran a daycare, sold dinners and bean pies, and actively participated in her family's lives, handling a diverse range of responsibilities. 
Since Pearl was so actively involved socially, everyone immediately noticed her missing. Unfortunately, on 22nd November 1996, Pearl's lifeless body was found in a vacant house on the 700 block of Lafayette Avenue in Kansas City. The house belonged to her late mother. Pearl's autopsy revealed she had been brutally stabbed over 40 times, her clothes stripped away and strewn nearby. The case was in the hands of KCPD detective Roger Golubsky. Detective Golubsky was accused of various offenses. He misused his position of authority numerous times. From 1983 to 2008, KCPD failed to investigate various women, all similar in age and mostly working women, whose lives were taken in a similar fashion. Frequently, these women found themselves struggling with homelessness, substance addiction, or engaged in offering escort services. Their tragic fates often involved brutal methods such as strangulation, other forms of asphyxiation, blunt force trauma, or stabbing. Their lifeless bodies were callously abandoned in remote areas or isolated structures. In a disturbing pattern, all of these women were discovered either partially or fully unclothed, with their pants pulled off or shirts pulled down. Lastly, the articles of clothing worn by the victims were typically found nearby. Christina King tragically experienced all these harrowing circumstances. With the passage of time, while the cases went cold, it became more and more apparent that something was wrong with Golubsky. Although Roger Golubsky was acquainted with most, if not all, of the women who were mercilessly slain, none of the case files reflected his provision of knowledge about these women. Despite the abundance of potential physical evidence available for analysis, most of these particular cases received inadequate forensic attention. This resulted in either limited evidence collection or insufficient efforts to identify potential assailants whose DNA or other forensic results could be compared. The incompetence was remarkable. In fact, in the case of Christina King, the KCPD received a DNA match with a potential suspect, but failed to conduct a follow-up investigation. Khadija Hardway, moved by the prolonged neglect of Golubsky's victims' pleas for justice, found inspiration to collaborate with the community in organizing rallies and demonstrations. The goal was to ensure that the unsolved cases the faces of the affected women and their stories would not fade into oblivion. Motivated by Pearl's case, she joined forces with like-minded women to establish a nonprofit called Justice for Wyandotte in 2020. The organization worked hard in an attempt to fight against the department's corrupt individuals. Officers were noticed using too much force, bullying, scaring, making up evidence, wrongly arresting people, and making individuals give false testimony to avoid getting falsely accused and imprisoned. Thanks to Justice for Wyandotte, highlighting the crimes, they exposed the systematic corruption. They highlighted the case of a falsely accused and imprisoned Lamont McIntyre, who served 23 years for a crime he did not commit. He was arrested on the watch of Roger Golubsky. While exonerated in 2017, he never got justice. Golubsky roamed free. Still, there was a lot left regarding Golubsky where women were often victimized by him. In the course of her work with the organization, Hardaway initiated a meeting with Carl Oakman, who was a candidate for chief of police back then. 
During this meeting, she addressed the evident and unacceptable apathy surrounding unsolved cold cases in the community, emphasizing the lasting impact on Kansas City families and loved ones. She strongly advocated for the establishment of a cold case unit within the Kansas City Police Department. Following the meeting with Oakman, Justice for Wyandotte launched an awareness campaign and petitioned for the creation of a dedicated cold case unit, aiming to address the numerous unsolved cases that had occurred in Kansas City since 1965. Back in 2003, police got a DNA hit on the condom found near Christina's battered body. The suspect was identified, Gary Davis, yet shockingly he was not immediately brought in for questioning. It took 14 months to question Gary Davis, despite his being under intensive supervision by Wyandotte County Community Corrections. 52-year-old Gary Davis was a Kansas City resident, but at the time of the alleged incidents of Christina and Pearl, he was a 23- to 25-year-old truck driver. It made sense why, back then, he would have escaped any type of connections, because the nature of his job would send him miles away from the scene of the crime. Police knew his whereabouts at all times, Yet it took a whole 20 years to arrest Davis. It was a slow process where everyone seemed to drag their feet. It would take the department 14 months to interrogate the suspect, and then everything went silent for 20 years. Then, after the public appeal of Justice for Wyandotte in 2021, it took another 18 months to process the DNA, assign a team, and subsequently arrest the perpetrator. In 2022, the cold case unit made the connections, and it immediately popped up. The DNA from both the crime scenes matched their initial suspect, Gary Davis Sr. Officers further found a Facebook page matching the name and description of Davis. The page had various controversial and offensive posts but most were focused on truck driving and society's double standards regarding men and women. Officers trying to reach him realized out of the three listed phone numbers he had, only one was operational, and it was not taking messages because the voice mailbox was full. In September 2023, Davis was finally arrested and charged with taking Christina King's life. His bail was set to be $500,000. Additionally, there was no statute of limitations, which meant the cases could be pursued and he would be charged, tried, and convicted, regardless of how long ago the crime was. If convicted, he would face life in prison. In an unexpected move, Wyandotte County District Attorney Mark Dupre and Kansas City Police Chief Carl Oakman held a news conference praising their investigative work. Dupre claimed the detectives had worked tirelessly, while Oakman downplayed the significance of the DNA hit, emphasizing the need for a thorough investigation. In fact, they minimized the role of a DNA hit claiming it took effort to analyze and ensure the right suspect was put behind bars. As for Golubsky, in March of 2022, attorney Cheryl Pilotti, representing Kansas City, drew attention to the corrupt culture within the KCPD. She filed a statement intending to indict not just disgraced detective Roger Golubsky, but the entire culture in which he thrived. Golubsky, in charge of a wrongful arrest, was charged with federal crimes, including kidnapping, intimate assault, and trafficking. Currently, the KCPD is working with other law enforcement agencies to determine whether Davis was responsible for other slayings in the area. Or, perhaps, since he was a long-haul driver, 
thousands of miles away. Davis is currently a suspect or person of interest in at least eight more cases. The cold case unit established thanks to Justice for Wyandotte would go on to solve 11 more cases. It is safe to assume that the KCPD is liable for allowing nearly 30 years to pass before making an arrest that would have been possible years ago. The department owed the victims' families an apology and a good explanation. The traumatized loved ones, especially Christina's daughters, who spent years looking for closure, were all victims of an incompetent department.